Fatima, you're muted. Good morning or good afternoon, wherever you are. Welcome to the, this webinar organized by the Policy Center for the New South. This is Fatima Zahra Bin Goop speaking, economist at the Policy Center for the New South, and I will be your moderator for today's discussion. Today's discussion is about water scarcity that many of countries in the world are facing. We all know that we live in planet Earth, and this planet Earth is also named Blue Planet because there is a lot of water here in, in this Earth, but most of these water are salty or frozen, trapped in oceans and, uh, and uh, poles. Uh, only 1% of this liquid water is, can be used uh, as in, uh, in, ma in many different uses, like uh, drinking water, irrigation, or uh, industry. And even more than that, this, these small quantities of water are unevenly, uh, unevenly distributed by, uh, among countries. There are some countries that are, that are benefiting from a lot of uh, huge quantities of water, such as Canada, or um, countries uh, that are located in the MENA region, for, for example, that are suffering from a shortage of water. More than that, this water is a vital resource for all and everyone. We cannot live without this water because it is vital and it procures a lot of uh, a lot of benefits from drinking to producing food to producing goods and to producing services for for example tourism and other other sectors so we know that water is very important for life but this shortage uh, procure a lot, a lot of uh, procures a lot of uh, a lot of problems among countries that should be tackled tackled to in order to better manage this water. Uh, to to or to discuss this topic, we have with us uh, a high level experts in this uh, in this field. Uh, we have uh, we can uh, we have invited. We have invited uh, experts that will uh, share with us their insights and they can enlighten us further about uh, the situation of water in around, around the world. For this discussion, we have with us Her Excellency Ambassador Josefa Lionel Correra Seco, who is leading African Economist and Commissioner for Rural Economy and Agriculture of the African Union Commission. Before that, she was special advisor to two ministers in Angola. The Angolan Minister of Environment, where she also served as ambassador, uh, ambassador for responsible for climate change and advisor to the Minister of Agriculture in charge of food security and poverty reduction. Uh, Your Excellency, thank you for, in, uh, for accepting our invitation and the most welcome to you. Thank uh, you. You're welcome. Uh, we have with us also Professor Mohamed Ait Al Qadi, who is President of the General Council of Agricultural Development, which is a high level policy think tank of the Ministry of Agriculture, Fisheries, Rural Development, and Forestry in Morocco. Professor Ait Al Qadi was also Secretary General of the Ministry and Director General uh, of uh, the Irrigation Department. He chairs the Scientific Committee of the Adaptation of African Agriculture Initiative AAA. Thank you for accepting our invitation, Mr. Ait Al-Qadi. You're welcome. We have with us also Mr. Alexandru Kosmin Botika, who is water supply and sanitation specialist at the World Bank. He has contributed to developing and implementing several large technical assistance programs, knowledge product and investment lending operations across the ECA region. He has worked on flutter security, diagnostics, rural water supply and sanitation, and other important topics related to, the, to water. Welcome, Mr. Alexandru. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here with you. Most welcome. Uh, we have with us also Mr. Guy uh, Jobbins, who is director at uh, Astent and a research associate uh, at the ODI in London. His work focuses on institutional uh, political and social dimensions of water security and climate resilience with a particular interest in the North African and West Asia regions. Thank you for accepting our invitation, Mr. Dekay. Thank you very much. Uh, last but not least, we have with us Professor Rabia Mukhtar, who is Senior Fellow at the Policy Center for the New South, and Professor and Dean of the Faculty and Agriculture and Food Sciences at the American University of Beirut. 
He works on different fields related to water, but he focuses on civil and biological agriculture engineering, environmental and ecological engineering, and water energy food nexus. He is also a professor at Texas and e and uh, University, College Station, Texas, and adjunct professor at Purdue University. Welcome, Mr. Rabi Mukhtar. Uh, thank you all for accepting our invitation. To organize the flow, we will proceed as follows. We will keep the same order as announced in the introduction. Each speaker has about 10 to 12 minutes to intervene. And the last 30 minutes of the webinar will be devoted, devoted sorry, to, discuss and, uh, to discussion and questions from the audience. So, uh, Your Excellency, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Fatima, for giving me the floor. Uh, good afternoon uh, from Addis Ababa. Uh, good morning or good evening, depending on uh, your geographical uh, location. Uh, Excellency, the chair, best, and the chair of uh, the Policy Center for, for South, uh, uh, for the New South, distinguished delegates or participants, ladies and gentlemen, and all protocol duly observed, and distinguished uh, colleagues, uh, panelists. Let me register my appreciation for the invitation that was extended to us to participate in this very important webinar. Water is a source of life, vital for human survival and critical for our ecosystem health. It is a catalyst for our development, including the realization of our agenda 20, uh, 2063. Water is a critical input into most sectors, including agriculture, energy, tourism, health, and even transport. For Africa, uh, although there are for Africa, although there are abundant water resources in some of the countries, including the world's second largest freshwater lake, Lake Victoria in East Africa, we all know about it, and the deepest lake in the world, like Lake Tanganyika, the continent is largely a thirsty one. We are lacking water in this continent. Most of the northern and the southern Africa are arid region characterized by deserts. Climate variability and frequency as well as the intense drought exacerbated water scarcity. The split of water scarcity in Africa is also made worse by poor infrastructure, limited investment in the sector, and the fact that this area is not prioritized in most countries. The lack of infrastructure results in water losses and waste production as well as uh, transaction costs, which hamper growth and the ability of government to pursue economic and social development uh, policies. Groundwater represents only 15% of Africa's total renewable water resources, and yet about 75% of its population rely on groundwater domestic use. Many African countries are, are already experiencing water stress leading to water scarcity. This has, this has effects on the country's development trajectory and has a consequence, they cannot even attract water intense factories or embark on large scale irrigation projects. Sca uh, water scarcity also undermines the continent's effort to climate change adaptation, especially for small older farmers. We have, uh, we have communities who find it's difficult even to wash hands regularly in order to control the pandemic of coronavirus due to water scarcity. The demand for water is also on the, on the increase and the situation is compounded by the multiplicity of water uses. In 2017, the World Bank Group indicated that globally 70% of fresh water is used for agriculture. It's a further stress, stress that by 2050, 
fill a planet of 9 million people will require an estimated 50% increase in agriculture production and a 15% increase in water with, uh, withdrawals. The in recognition of the importance of water and sanitation for social, economic, and environment development of the continent, the African leaders reaffirm commitment in, in, the, in July uh, 2000 and, uh, 2008, Sham El-Sheikh commitment on water and sanitation to promote cooperation and integration among member states with a view to raising the living standard of the population and the well-being of the future generation. There is also the African Water Vision 2020, an African where there is an, an, an equitable and sustainable use and management of water resources for poverty alleviation, social economic development, regional cooperation, and the environment. Unfortunately, this vision is not yet been implemented properly by our member states. And I pledge that we should look at this vision, African Water Vision 2025, because it is a vision approved by our head of state and is the African the continental strategy. That's where we have to focus. Despite this framework, Africa remains trapped in water scarcity and solutions are needed like the implementation of African Water Vision 2025. Permit me to state that uh, despite this framework, Africa remains trapped in water scarcity. There is therefore need for innovation solution, including a multi-stakeholder collaboration in order to meet the current and future demand and solve the water scarcity problem. The, uh, furthermore, Africa needs to double investment in water in order to boost economic development, as well as the productivity of some sector as they rely on water. The, this entail upgrading water infrastructure, improving maintenance and construction of the ones. Critic, uh, critical also in Africa is the need to strengthen transboundary water projects and establish effective cooperation agreement for transboundary rivers basin and share water courses. There is need to further explore the option of water technology to intensify effort in water research for water, for increased water availability. The African Union Commission coordinates the monitoring, the monitoring, monitoring, sorry, the, uh, for environment and security in Africa, MESA, MESA project that facilitated the RECs and the uh, member states in decision making in policy for climate information, data, and water availability, availability through the use of Earth observation for meteorological satellites. The project also had a component on training, and it trained over 1,000 experts on the continent. As I conclude, I would like to reiterate the commitment of the African Union Commission to work with all the a stakeholder, including our partners, in advancing the African water and sanitation agenda for the achievement of our 2030 SDGs and goal number six and the realization of Agenda 2063. Uh, the Africa we all want. I thank you for your kind attention. Muito obrigado. Merci beaucoup. Shukran. Thank you, Your Excellency, for your very insightful and fruitful uh, information that you have shared with us. So let me just summarize some uh, some points that you have discussed in your intervention. You you stressed out the importance of the water resources in Africa, and you also to, uh, you also spoke about uh, external shocks like like climate change that that is uh, exacerbating an already uh, fragile uh, situation. You also to, uh, spoke about uh, the engagement or, or the commitment of African leaders in, uh, in order to better manage their resources and also stressed out the importance of ground, groundwater as 
as it is used uh, in a very in domestic uh, in the domestic use uh, for uh, many Africans. And uh, also, you point out the uh, the importance of uh, of technology as uh, as it could it could be used uh, used as a, a solution to better manage uh, the, the the water, which is a very scare. Uh, in uh, different Af African countries. So, so thank you so much, mucho obrigado for you, your excellency. And uh, I, I, I invite Mr. Aytul Qadi to, uh, to, to present his uh, intervention and uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Fatima. Let me share my uh, presentation. Excellency, Ambassador uh, Joseph Asaku, uh, colleagues and friends, dear participants, I am pleased to speak in this panel and share uh, the stage with my distinguished uh, co-panelist. Before sharing a few initial thoughts, I would like to thank uh, Policy Center for the View South for its kind invitation. Changes uh, in socioeconomic and demographic dynamics in combination with uh, technical and other changes are increasing the demand for a wide range of goods and services, all of which require more water. In the opposite direction, climate change is posing tangible challenges for societies. A predominant feature on the supply side of water management is more uncertainty and more pronounced amplitude in fresh water resources availability. Today, many countries like the luxury of unused water resources and face severe and increasing water scarcity. Virtually the whole of South Asia and the Near East North Africa regions have depleted a significant share of their renewable water resources. More than 1.2 billion persons live in, in river basins where absolute water scarcity or trends of increasing shortages are serious concerns. In most of these countries, new and increased water supplies are going to be hard to find and new water cannot be relied upon to make up large scale inefficiencies as it often has in the past. Therefore, high water stressed countries have no choice. They must make a decisive break from past policies and management pra practices to embrace a holistic water sector approach that is economically, socially, and environmentally sustainable. According to the World Bank report published in 2016, entitled High and Dry, Climate Change, Water and the Economy, I quote, if current water management policies persist and climate models prove correct, water scarcity will proliferate to regions where it currently does not exist and will greatly worsen in regions where water is already 
scarce. And uh, I'm showing here in these slides the results of the economic modeling that is described in the report, which suggests that bad water management policies can exacerbate the adverse growth impacts of climate change, while good policies can go a long way towards neutralizing them. In my view, given the huge diversity of hydrological situations, there is no blueprint approach and no straightforward solution valid for all countries under all circumstances. Success will come from deploying the right tools and approaches but in a way that is sensitive to local circumstances. Broadly speaking, two general responses can be suggested. First, the need to devote more balanced attention to both demand management and supply augmentation, including reuse and desalination, whose cost effectiveness is increasing. And second, water development and water allocation must be more purposeful, conscious, and calculated. More emphasis should be given to this uh, second response, considering, for example, how international trade can contribute to addressing problems related to unequal geographical distribution of water. This is, uh, Excellency, is most relevant in the context of the Africa's free trade uh, zone, which entered into force early this year. In the case of uh, Morocco, the 1995 severe drought triggered a change in thinking about achieving food security given that the liberalization of agricultural trade widens the entire spectrum of, of economic possibilities, offering the country the potential to efficiently allocate its water resources and to make the most of its comparative advantages in the agricultural sector. In this context, we had to address the following strategic questions. How much irrigation do we need to meet the future needs of growing and urbanizing population? How to restructure consumption patterns from wasteful and low value water intensive uses? How farmers can achieve higher production and livelihood for every drop of water? What will be the side effect in the rural community if water is transferred to cities? What should be the strategies for balancing water needs for irrigation and environment? Does the import of food virtual water support security and efficient allocation of water? These questions are captured in this diagram representing the nexus water agricultural agriculture and trade as i have conceptualized it at that time maybe we can have time in the discussion back to the diagram today morocco imports the equivalent of Six billion cubic meter, which is roughly the capacity of our two largest dams. And we export in virtual water roughly 800 
50 million cubic meters. More globally, to meet the challenge posed by the growing water scarcity, Morocco has adopted an integrated approach to water management through mutually reinforcing policies and institutional reforms, as well as the development of a long-term investment program. A new water law was promulgated in 1995. It was updated in 2006, 16. It provides a comprehensive framework for integrated water management. So, colleagues and friends, let me conclude by understanding that this water scarcity challenge should not be underestimated. While the scale and complexity of this multidimensional challenge are huge, solutions are within reach. Understanding the connectivity between the multiple dimensions of water scarcity is a critical step in effective policy design, policy and implementation, and consensus building. Hence, there is no alternative but for governments to roll up their sleeves and to do the hard analytical work to understand complex hydrological systems, to determine the cost and benefits of specific policy intervention, and to make difficult de decisions about the inevitable trade-offs involved in water management and development. Trade-offs will not be zero-sum games. Compromises will be needed based not only on techno-economic and environmental terms, but also on socio-political and geopolitical consideration. So finally, let's, let us say that to build back better, let's make the water challenge an opportunity, an opportunity to innovate, an opportunity to invest, an opportunity to become economically and societally savvy, smart and just, and an opportunity to ascertain our sustainable future. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Ayd al-Qadi, for this very fruitful intervention. So let me just take um, a few minutes to summarize the uh, most important points of your presentation. You showed uh, with figures uh, the impact of climate change on water resources. Uh, and you said that is true that lack of water is a global, but pro a global problem, but government must be or should be intelligent and adopt a solution adapted to the local context. You said also that the example of Morocco is an interesting case in terms of water management policy, especially in the agricultural sector. But there are other questions that must always be taken into consideration, especially since the problem is becoming more and more severe. So this is why innovation is so important in, in the sector. So uh, let, let's move to the third uh, third uh, uh, speaker mr alexandro the floor is yours thank you thank you very much for first of all extending this invitation um i think this is an excellent uh, topic that needs to be more and more uh, engaged on and discussed uh, going forward um I'm really grateful to be part of this selected panel with distinguished guests. Um, and it's also been very great to hear uh, Her Excellency Ambassador Sako, as well as Professor Ait Kadi already uh, frame up the discussion and laying out clearly out there the, 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 the scarcity of the water in the region, the issues that we are confronting with. And uh, I'm trying now to maybe frame a bit my intervention towards 
what could be possible ways to address some of the problems in the future. Um, and before I start, let me also um, really extend my gratitude and appreciation for the Policy Center for the New South. Um, and uh, it's really great to reconnect with, with friends. Um, I've been part of the Emerging Leaders Network of uh, the Atlantic Dialogue since 2015, and it's been really great to see how much effort you put into nurturing and developing networks across generations, and how much effort you put into bringing uh, relevant stakeholders at roundtables to come up with solutions. Now, moving back to the topic of today on, on water scarcity, um, governments in the region will absolutely have to increase their water sector's resilience and the sustainability. It's clear there's no absolutely no escape from this. The good news is that there are multiple ways towards achieving water security and sustainable development across the region. And I was just trying to pinpoint, pinpoint a few of them, um, and uh, hopefully we can engage more in, a, in the Q&A discussion. Um, first, water is a connector. Water should be perceived as an integrator, as well uh, remarked by, uh, by the previous speakers. Water links all industries and all sectors, and uh, the water goal, um, SDG 6, is actually interconnected with all the other SDGs, so it's a vital element. And thus, water planning and water um, uh, policies should be better unified. So, in this case, Integrated water resources management is key in achieving water security and for sustaining water. This implies water resource management that has to happen not only at river basin level, but also at city, at country, and even at transboundary levels. It is highly important to keep um, the watersheds, the aquifers healthy, and they have to stay healthy beyond any administrative, any political, or any sectoral boundaries. Um, nowadays, roughly 80% of the wastewater is actually discharged directly into the natural environment without it being reused. Um, there's also approximately 40 and in some cases it's up to 50% of the drinking water that is wasted due to the physical and the commercial losses. Um, and this is a major issue that is also contributing to the region's intermittent water supply. So ways to diminish this non-revenue water and treating the wastewater are untapped opportunities that could help address water security better in the region. And thus, a more circular perspective should be embraced, drawing also on the fact that wastewater contains valuable resources. One is water, of course, but also nutrients and has the potential to, uh, to, to create energy. Um, another important pillar I would uh, focus on is resilient infrastructure. And the World Bank has actually published uh, two years ago a report entitled Integrating Green and Grey. And it basically um, uh, provides international best practices on how a new generation of green infrastructure projects that harness the power of nature can help to achieve some of the developmental goals, including the water security and the climate resilience. Um, natural systems such as forests, such as floodplains, such as uh, soils, can contribute to cleaner, to more reliable water supply, and can also help communities be better protected against floods as well as droughts. So combining this new green type of infrastructure uh, with the traditional grey infrastructure, such as the dams, the reservoirs, the treatment systems or the pipes, these can actually uh, provide better solutions in combination and would enhance some of the system performance and can even uh, lead to better protection of communities. Um, water utilities, irrigation agencies, hydropower companies, they all can deliver more cost-effective and resilient services by integrating green infrastructure into their plants. And because we speak about water scarcity, storing water is also a very important topic um, and uh, expanding basically the water supply and availability in cities and beyond is vital. So proper development of um, water storage, uh, water reuse, but also recycling and where viable, even desalination, as it is already happening in some of the Gulf states and other, other technologies that are already on the market could help create the so-called new water and should be uh, more uh, approached and uh, implemented in the future. And uh, because we talk about solutions, um, and uh, the previous speakers have mentioned innovations. Innovations can come up through new sort of technologies that have already been launched on the markets and have been uh, tested and implemented successfully across the globe. Um, innovations in water technology show huge potential. 
Um, examples range vastly from water supply, such as desalination, as already mentioned, but also, let's say, solar pumping, to industrial efficiency, such as more efficient water reuse, to remote sensing of water, to agricultural technologies, um, better crop protection, uh, smart irrigation controls, etc. Um, farmers could be better incentivized to grow drought resistant crops, which means that when a disaster strikes, when drought, for example, inevitably hits, the farmers will be more resilient in the face of adversity. And uh, last year, actually, the World Bank also hosted um, a so-called Water Innovation Accelerator uh, event. It was a virtual event due to the uh, coronavirus pandemic, but it showcased and brought together 14 water technology businesses across the globe. And uh, these uh, new technologies on the market already were uh, clearly presenting some interesting results. Um, and just to mention a few examples, um, there were uh, companies that have developed forecasting uh, and water management platforms for state government agencies using satellite imagery, using in situ sensors, using predictive analytics. So these are already available on the market and could be further explored. Um, mobile water management platforms uh, for water utilities. These are also important have, and have become mainstream in some regions and they can help improve the quality of their services towards customers, but can also bring in operational intelligence solutions uh, for wastewater and water utilities to reduce their losses, to assess their network health in real time, and to improve their revenues. But all these technologies, I would say, will not be that efficient if it were not for data. And uh, this, I would highly stress that data is vital. Data and information are necessary for public authorities, for utilities, for institutions, to make better informed decisions on water. However, we see, unfortunately, that data is lacking in the region and is quite limited in some others. So disruptive technology, um, digital transformation, satellites, virtual sensors, mobile phone applications, these could all ensure more data-driven management and could help improve the understanding of water balances. And um, I will also refer to one last pillar, let's say, within my intervention, and that is the one um, on policies and institutions. Business as usual is not an option anymore. Progress requires a new network of ideas and for institutions to come together to develop these solutions. Um, in this regard, institutional processes, um, institutional reforms must go hand in hand with policy and legislation. So to achieve water security in the region, there needs to be a shift away from the siloed solutions to the more inclusive and to the more integrated ones. Innovative solutions can offer unprecedented opportunities and can help the region uh, jump forward towards better water security, towards resilience, towards sustainable development. But I would say that it is really key to ensure transparent ways of allocating water equitably and efficiently to protect the water resources, but at the same time to educate and to empower people. And there are also considerable inclusion issues in the region. Not everyone benefits from water resources and services equally across the region. Some individuals and some groups are systematically excluded. So for this point, I would say that it's really important to increase women's ownership and control of assets um, in the forefront. And water operations should also be more inclusive and um, should ensure more accessible water services for persons with disabilities, for younger people, for the elderly or for any other vulnerable and marginalized communities. I would uh, maybe stop here my intervention, but I would be uh, really glad to expand more maybe during the Q&A session. Thank you so much. Thank you, Alexandro, for this very informative presentation. So before going uh, through your uh, key point, to, through the key points of your intervention, I just, I just would like to invite our kind audience to ask their question on our uh, social network so we can discuss them during the Q&A uh, session. So as you said, we cannot escape uh, water management. Hence the importance of using technological change to better manage this scarce uh, resource. Among these technologies, water storage is important. The use of alternative water resources is also a solution to be adopted. Uh, other technologies concerning uh, water demand, such as the use of new techniques and technologies, and also, uh, also uh, 
farmers can, can uh, better inform farmers can be can be used as technique to better manage uh, manage uh, manage water resources you highlighted also the the importance of data and the information you said that they are vital to better manage uh, manage uh, water so thank you very much for this very informative and uh, insightful presentation and i move to to mr uh, guy jobins to and i let him the floor to present his uh, intervention thank you so much thank you so much for the kind introduction fatima and many thanks to the policy center for the new south for the introduction to speak here today and uh, my gratitude also to the speakers who have gone before me who have uh, laid out the groundwork and the frame so well which allows me almost just to build on the ideas that have already been presented so i'm in a very fortunate position speaking at this this point so uh, we've heard about the growing water insecurity challenges um, globally but also particularly in the north africa and middle east region um, we've heard about the promise of technology and we've also heard about the inherent trade-offs that we may be presented with as uh, we try to balance the sustainability of water consumption with the need to produce more food and meet growing demand from urban areas um, for water for wash systems, water supply and sanitation systems, but also for non-agricultural sector jobs, whether in the services or in industry, so forth. So we have a, a sense of some of the challenges and this, this sense that technology may offer um, some powerful opportunities and solutions for us. So I don't want to puncture this optimism. I, I want to lay out some challenges and some questions that I personally have. Um, and my questions relate to two aspects. Uh, one is about the nature of technology and where it is applied and what kind of technologies we're talking about. And, and the second is a more political economy question about the role of water in political decision-making. So the, I'll start in reverse order perhaps and just sort of point out that many of us gathered here today have an interest in water. We think it's important, we're aware of the scarcity, we're aware of the challenges that poses to economic growth, um, social, social security, stability and so forth. Um, but we also know that when it comes to hard-nosed political decision making, water is never prioritised. Governments are always under pressure to make immediate decisions to provide jobs to grow the economy and whilst we can make an argument that long term big changes are needed to ensure this growth is sustained and that jobs are generated in the future these problems can seem quite distant and actually governments are faced with investors coming in they want to make investments they want to create jobs this year and so balancing these sorts of trade-offs over time can be politically very very challenging despite the red flags and the warning signals that we are raising the, the, the second question is really about technology, and, and I think my, my intervention here will be slightly longer, so please bear with me. But I just want to make the point that, you know, technology offers different kinds of benefits, different kinds of efficiencies. And it offers um, these at different levels and to different actors. So if we think about what governments can do, Governments in the water security space can really do one of two or three different things. One thing that they can do is they can deliver public programs and large public sector investments. So we've heard already about the opportunities for wastewater treatment and recycling, and clearly that's a powerful tool. Desalination technologies for cities on the coast is another powerful uh, promise for the future. Um, another area which I have a personal interest in is um, early warning systems and digitization technologies has been mentioned, increasing sensors, streams and resources, but also early warning systems for drought and linking those to more uh, proactive drought risk management measures where we can know that a drought is coming and the government can deploy resources to drought afflicted areas before the impacts are manifest. And this can have a powerful impact for uh, poor farmers, uh, vulnerable communities, and, and so on. So th these are not to be sneezed at. These are powerful tools. But often when we talk about technology uh, for water security, we're talking about things that might happen um, in the household or the firm or the farm level. Uh, 
And I want to talk particularly about the farm level because we know that most of the water in the Middle East and North Africa region is uh, consumed in almost all countries, is consumed largely in agriculture. We saw from Professor Akadi's uh, map of water um, insecurity and where the projected costs are that in the Middle East and North Africa, even with water efficient policies, according to this World Bank study, um, water insecurity will still be costing, you know, around 6% of GDP in, in the uh, Middle East North Africa region. That's a huge economic burden. And much of that is coming from the consumption of water in agriculture. So the, the hope, the aspiration, the ideal is that there will be technologies that are developed that can release water from agriculture for reallocation to the cities. And my contention is that technology alone doesn't allow the reallocation. It has to be accompanied by technical and institutional and policy uh, options that, that allow that to happen. And actually those interventions are quite complex to engineer in a way that really allows us to see those water transfers happen. Um, and one of the things is, is that when you think about the kinds of technologies that would allow radical reductions in the consumption of water in agriculture at the same time when agricultural production has to increase by 50%, as we've heard, you're thinking about technology that is really very disruptive. So what would that technology look like? Now, we, we have some ideas. We can see some examples. Um, drip irrigation and micro irrigation has been one technology that has been rolled out a lot. And from that, we can see some of the challenges of getting it into the hands of the poorest farmers, people who have small amounts of land, just uh, a quarter of a hectare, for example, find it very difficult to benefit from drip irrigation. So the main people who benefit from it are the large, rich farmers who have extensive land holdings and are most able to capitalize on the opportunities of this technology. Um, it can also have impacts on rural jobs um, and in terms of uh, unskilled agricultural labor, for example, it may find less employment in regions which uh, adopt irrigation, drip irrigation widely. But most importantly, perhaps, is that by itself, drip irrigation does not reduce the consumption of water. What it does is it increases the dollars per drop or the crop per drop, perhaps, which encourages farmers to expand the irrigation area and grow more water intensive crops and so forth. So the technology has to be accompanied by institutional and policy options that allow for the reallocation of the water to achieve these water savings, as we like to say. And we can see similar issues might arise in the incredibly innovative technologies that are coming down the line in the next 10 to 20 years. We now have more and more examples of controlled environment farming in which, which looks nothing at all like traditional agriculture with crops being grown in a field. They're grown in enclosed spaces using technologies like aeroponics, which allow for fantastically improved irrigation efficiencies, um, or even more adventurously molecular agriculture in which meat is effectively grown in a laboratory. And we're fairly certain that within 10 years, certainly in America and Europe, this may become cheaper than farm produced meat again offering fantastic water savings but one asks who will benefit in terms of the food production from those technologies and it's unlikely to be small poor farmers in the most vulnerable areas these communities are more likely to be increasingly marginalized as these technologies are introduced so to come back to the political question why don't governments today enact the transformational changes that reallocate water from agriculture to cities? And the answer we know is that it's because it's extremely challenging. Um, we have to provide jobs in rural areas. Um, that's where poverty is often concentrated. There are large political costs to making these reallocations. So the question comes in what way will technology make these choices easier? particularly when we consider the very, very significant financial capital that will be required in the technologies and the very large profits that these technologies will offer and who, in terms of large corporations, wealthy landowners and so forth, will be making these investments. 
And so I'm not confident, I'm sorry to say, that many of these farm level technologies will um, make these reallocation decisions easier for governments. Um, and I suspect sometimes that we as water professionals um, can become too optimistic about the promise of technology because it uh, allows us to believe that things will get easier and they have to get easier. Um, and they allow us to convey positive messages to policymakers. Um, so I suppose my, uh, I hope this doesn't come across as too negative or too sad. I'm, I'm, I'm hoping to raise some challenges, but I suppose more than anything, what I'd like us to do is um, have very honest conversations with ourselves and very honest conversations with policymakers about some of the very, very difficult choices that the region faces. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Guy, for, for your intervention. It was, it was very honest and uh, very informative. You talked, uh, you spoke about the other uh, other side of the technology coin. Um, uh, certainly, you said that they offer the technology technology offers several benefits, but there are other problems that can uh, overwhelm. Uh, technology alone alone does not allow a real action, reallocation of water but the importance of putting in place water management policies that must be inclusive and, and that should benefit to all uh, farmers, small and, uh, and uh, big farmers. These technologies also uh, should um, increase, uh, this technology also increases uh, the value of water, but it doesn't reduce quantities of water consumed, which, uh, which uh, pose another problem in terms of sustainability of using water. And other, uh, the other point of your presentation is that um, uh, the importance of putting, of putting in place good practices and good measures to manage water. Certainly it is difficult at this time, but we should uh, have the requirement, or, but, we should, uh, we, but we should have put in place, uh, put in place measures that uh, will uh, allow us to, to ensure or to achieve uh, the requirements of economic and social development. So thank you for your uh, brilliant presentation, and I move. I will move to the last uh, last presentation uh, that should be done. But uh, Mr. Rabia, uh, thank you, and uh, the floor is yours, Mr. Rabia. Thank you, Fatma. Thank you, the Policy Center for the New South for hosting this uh, fabulous uh, session. Thank you for all the distinguished speakers who uh, went before me. Uh, I will not repeat a lot of the great uh, comments that was made in terms of the challenges, in terms of the climate, the population, the supply demand, uh, the issues that were raised also on the, uh, the integrated effect of water and the policy challenges that uh, uh, Guy mentioned. I'd like to build on those and focus on a sector that uh, acknowledged by all the speakers that uses most of the water, which is the agriculture sector, and I would like to focus on water for agriculture. That's the sector that uh, in many ways has been accused for sucking all of the resources, but it also is the foundation of the economy, foundation of the social stability, and the foundation of the resilience, food security, and more importantly, of the heritage and the connection with our past in the MENA region. So. Uh, acknowledging the fact that water in globally uses two thirds of the freshwater supply, but I would say that in the uh, in the MENA region, the dry areas in North Africa and MENA region, it uses more than more than that. It can reach up to eighty percent of the freshwater supply. Uh, we also realized uh, by earlier speakers that the business model, the business as usual, is not acceptable moving forward. So we have to have a radical change. Uh, we also looked into the, uh, the, the non-sustainable consumption behavior that was addressed by some of you. And I think this needs to also be put on the table. I think uh, many of the, many of the uh, habits that we have in the region are, uh, do not uh, lend itself for a better management of the water. Uh, before I move into the water for agriculture, we all realize that we've been dancing around the aspect that looking into a, a water management plan 
uh, for the region it does not come alone. It has to be discussed, deliberated, discussed, and, and uh, uh, converged with multiple sectors that go way, way beyond the water, water community. So we've talked about the agricultural community. I'd like also to mention the industry. I'd like also to, to put on the table the other sectors, such as the energy and other sectors that uh, are user beneficiaries of the water. So I think IWRM that was mentioned earlier by Alexandro is certainly a, 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 a necessary, but it's not sufficient. We need to go broader, a little bit broader, to look into a, a, the nexus between uh, the water, the energy, the food, the health, and the economy. And I think that's what, uh, what, what is needed. Uh, zooming in into the subject that I'd like to focus on, which is the water for food, soil is important. And I think we need to acknowledge that healthy soil is very critical to this relationship between water and food. And that is rarely discussed in, in, in our uh, deliberation. Uh, so soil is responsible for uh, our food security. It's, it's, for, it's also responsible for our uh, the, the biodiversity we all cherish. And is also responsible for the uh, keeping resilience in our communities and keeping them in place and uh, to avoid a lot of the migration that we have seen, uh, forced migration in, in some of the areas in our region. Uh, so moving forward, I'd like to maybe partition our discussion water for food into uh, different pockets. And uh, Guy mentioned uh, the, the technology, uh, the precision technology. This is certainly some area that uh, we needs to be discussed, needs to be elaborated more on. Uh, and in in here specifically, I talk about the 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 link between the science and practice. Today, we know a lot more about the soil water interaction and about precision irrigation that is actually practiced. It's not a matter only of uh, smart engineers coming up with sensors and big data. I think we, we know more about the soil water relationship and what does it, what, what, at what level you start looking at the nexus between productivity, between soil water availability and between the, the water values. And I think it's not only, and I really would like to emphasize that it's not only the electrical engineers and the, the smart engineers developing this technology. Those technology need to be embedded and need to be integrated with our better understanding of soil water processes. So, so, so uh, this is something very important. Uh, and, and I think it also needs to be coupled with the uh, trade-offs between productivity and water use. Uh, so, that, so that's the, the first aspect, which is the uh, precision irrigation. We also talked about the, the water productivity, and this is something very important that, for example, I question my own self here that uh, uh, many, many of the farmers that we advise in Lebanon are, uh, are into planting uh, tropical fruits. Tropical fruits, yes, they have high cash crop, they can work, but I think the productivity and what we, we grow and the cropping system needs to be part of that discussion. I will not uh, spend too much time on that because I'd like to spend more time on other aspect, which is water reuse, as was mentioned earlier by a couple of you. Uh, and, and then that's a discussion I would like to, to emphasize on. And the last but not least is the green water. Uh, two thirds of the food we eat in the, in the virtual water space, uh, the, trade, the tradable food is coming from green water. It's not coming from irrigated agriculture. And, and yet, if, you, if I look back into the, the physics. I mean, I'm a soil physicist. I started my career as a soil physicist, and we have five different definitions of what green water is. And I can tell you, if we don't define it and if we don't quantify it, we we cannot. If we cannot measure it, we cannot better manage it. So, so that's we need to really converge into a definition of green water and how do we manage it. In a in a study that we conducted actually for the entire North Africa region. And, and I'll be happy to share that uh, study with you. We, we found out that there's double, twice as much as green water we have in North Africa as combined all the uh, green uh, uh, blue water space that we have. I'm gonna repeat that. There's double the amount of green water, which is the water that's stored in the soil after gravitational water, after rain, then we have uh, uh, blue water. And yet we don't talk about it. We talk about the surface water, we talk about groundwater, we talk about all of this precious water that we see. 
but the, the, the water that we do not see, we don't talk about. And I think this is something we need to start uh, looking in more, more depth at that. So again, uh, defining it uh, as a start, what does it constitute and, and, and how do we measure it and how do we, uh, how do we manage it? Moving into the important area that you all we, we all mentioned that the, the wastewater reuse. Let's let's face the reality that this is not as a glossy as it looks like, for various reasons. The first reason is that it does impact the ecosystem. So, and we all know that irrigating with with high sodicity, high salinity uh, uh, irrigation water does have its on the soil ecosystem. And that needs to be looked at in a very, very careful way because we don't want to jump into it without looking at its, its consequences. There are a lot of research groups around the MENA region that's looking into this and we can build on their research. We don't really have to start from scratch. But the most important element of, of water reuse is that the farmland is way, way away from the, uh, the source of this uh, wastewater treatment. The large water wastewater treatment plant happens to be in, in mega cities in the region. And those mega cities are not in close proximity of the, the farmland. So we need to find a way in which we can transport at a low carbon, low cost, these, what I call them resource, water resource into where they can be used. So this is not something that we can take, take, take for granted. In a study we conducted in, in, in Gebes in uh, Southern Tunisia, I'd like to highlight a few of the highlights of, of that study. In one pilot plant, in one treat, wastewater treatment plant in Gibbous, we were able to uh, quantify 6.2 million cubic meter per year water that is, has been made available for irrigation use. And it happens that Gibbous is not too far from, a, uh, from farmland. We were able also to irrigate 6.7 hectares in irrigated crop additional uh, to what has been irrigated. So, so the, the uh, that is possible, but we need to couple it with easy ways, low carbon ways, low cost ways in which we can pump that water from a treated wastewater into the uh, uh, into where they can be used for, for irrigation. In here, I'd like to have a, a stop at where this impact is happening. We have done several studies and many, many have done many, many studies where connecting the wastewater treatment into changes, significant changes in soil water properties. What that means that if you irrigate after a repeated irrigation of treated wastewater, you're changing the soil properties. What that means, it means that the frequency of irrigation changes or should change. The amount of water you uh, uh, irrigate to at one irrigation uh, period is changed. So that is not an easy thing that we need to, to, uh, to move with without looking into how, how can they disseminate that information to farmers? Because farmers have the dissemination of knowledge through, th through centuries. And if we change that practice, we need to go back and really revise what they know we are, because we are changing the relationship between soil and water by using uh, these uh, uh, practices. I'm not, I'm actually suggesting we do move into uh, treated wastewater as a, as a practice. However, we cannot do it without looking into the whole ecosystem changes, the whole soil water relationship, and what does impact on irrigation practices. So as you can see, there's a lot of trade-offs, as mentioned by, by Dr. Al-Qadi, that needs to be looked at. These trade-offs are real. There are winners and there will be losers, but there need to be a society that comes and say, you know, enough is enough. We need to have a bold decisions moving uh, forward in terms of, of uh, these trade-offs and let's quantify them and let's look at this in a more transparent way and me make these decisions and these rules uh, 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 uniform across the board and and move forward I think the the, the uh, we are just the uh, uh, at the surface of these discussions uh, Guy mentioned very important element here that I'd like to, uh, to highlight is that it's not technology that would be the bottleneck for moving forward. It's some of these socioeconomics, that complexities uh, that, that will be uh, uh, here uh, against us in terms of moving forward, but we have no choice. I think business as usual is not an option. Uh, we have to make, somebody have to make these hard choices. We as scientists, we need to be the backbone of these decisions and we need to uh, put ourselves out there in front of the 
uh, decision makers, uh, support them, giving them the science, uh, the proper science that can enable them to do a better uh, policy making. Thank you, Fatma. Back to you. Uh, thank you, Rabia, for all this uh, information. You have shared with us several information about case studies and that they are uh, very interesting. But I will focus only on uh, the following points so we can discuss the other um, at the Q&A session. So you say that agric uh, that other sectors should be to, uh, taken into consideration, not all, not uh, not uh, agriculture alone, and uh, we should be more. Uh, we should have more global uh, and uh, approach to analyze all the nexus uh, that involve water resources. You said also that soil is uh, very important and must be taken into consideration also to improve income. Uh, it it also it it improve income for security and reduce migration. But, um, uh, and also you say that the link between science and practices uh, is very, uh, very explained uh, in, um, it's, it's explained very well in the science, from the science, from the technical uh, side and the science, the science side, but we have, a lot, uh, but we have, we should, uh, you sh we should uh, be more um, aware, uh, I, I mean, I mean, we not we should not just uh, look at the at the at the water resource from the engineer side because it is well explained in the literature, but we should take into consideration all other uh, other important po points such as uh, uh, analyzing uh, deeply the green water rather than uh, blue water because there is a huge uh, huge uh, potential in some region like in the MENA region that are full of well, green water and uh, the, that, the, 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 that this, this green matter, it's not, it's not taken into, into consideration while uh, putting, uh, putting in place strategies and policies to reduce, uh, uh, to better manage water. So thank you so much for, this inform for the, all this informations, information. And uh, we now, um, we now uh, can move to the session, uh, to the Q&A session. And I, uh, bega I, will, I will begin by the first question that is received from the audience. And it is related to the collect of fan on fans. So I will ask uh, your um, uh, excellency about this question. So there, uh, uh, the question is, are there enough real, uh, reliable uh, platform to collect fans to tackle water scarcity? In your opinion, your, your excellency. Thank you. I think there is a, enough, uh, a lot of platform whereby we can really mobilize uh, or invest in terms of the water program. There is that, but the issue is that we need to have really bankable projects and a clear vision in order to, you know, address all the challenges this uh, sector is facing. But concerning uh, funding, I think uh, we, we have enough, we have the World Bank, we have the African Development Bank, we have the EU, that we can, we can uh, really cooperate with them and uh, get uh, finance for the infrastructure, all these uh, identified uh, gaps and weak areas that uh, we need to improve on water scarcity. Even our own uh, government should make it, as I said on my own statement, they should make it as a priority and you know, really a budget for all these uh, water action because this is really a very, very important sector and we cannot neglect it. Everything is done about water. We can do without electricity, but we cannot do without water. So the importance of this sector makes you know, all of us to get committed in order to really improve all the obstacles this uh, sector is facing. I thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Your Excellency. I have another question about uh, the efficiency and, uh, and technology. So I, I will address them uh, to uh, both Alexandro and, uh, and uh, Guy. Uh, so the question is, how can, uh, can we efficiently use technology to, incre to increase the awareness of the people around water shortages. So I address to, uh, to both of you because you have a uh, different uh, opinion of, uh, on, uh, on technology. So we can have uh, the two sides of the, of, the, of the answer. 
Thank you. Should I start or Guy, do you want to go ahead? Thank you. Um, this is a very interesting question. And um, I, I would actually say we don't really have diverging co conclusions or ideas. I think he well pointed out that technology is key, but nevertheless, its complexity and uh, behind the scenes are pretty much important. And there needs to be a lot of uh, things that go hand in hand from policies, from processes, from institutions that uh, uh, go beyond the practical solutions that can be achieved at the technical level. So in my opinion, and uh, maybe as a also concluding remark of what uh, what has been heard through uh, all the distinguished uh, panelists today is that political commitment and leadership um, jointly uh, with the technological innovations, with breakthroughs in service delivery, but as also with financing models, as um, uh, Her Excellency Ambassador Sako just mentioned, uh, they all need to go hand in hand and support governments to deliver on their commitment to, to the SDGs. Um, it's clear that the pressure on water is rising, there needs to be urgent action. Uh, solutions must be bold enough, as uh, Professor Rabi mentioned, to match the scale of the challenges. So effective climate change adaptation will require sound water management to reduce vulnerabilities and to build um, resilience. So technology solutions uh, could, could be widely uh, disseminated, could be wi widely uh, spread around the continent, uh, across all regions but it's also important to double those with uh, strengthening institutions, strengthening capacities, uh, for example, I don't know, strengthening hydromet services, uh, better climate smart agricultural planning, um, a better infrastructure, maybe through nature-based approaches and sustainable solutions. And uh, given that education is also key and important, uh, I do believe, and I would reiterate the fact that uh, the youth, I, I strongly uh, advocate that the youth should also be empowered. The Millennium Development Goals and the Sustainable Deve Development Goals have been crafted and laid out by people who would inevitably retire. So at one point in time, it will be uh, the matter of the younger generation to step up front and to actually take the lead in tackling some of these challenges. So unless we go back to the communities and unless we communicate openly to the current situations that we have um, and to the potential damages that are coming up front, um, we will not probably hear their voices and we will not be able to capitalize on some of the useful ideas and innovations that can actually spur from the younger generations. So uh, I would frame the whole technology uh, and the education question into how we can actually better work across generations and how we can also bring all the relevant stakeholders and institutions to be more effective in delivering and implementing them. I'll stop here and I'll hand over to Guy. Thanks. Yeah, thanks, Alexander. Uh, great points, and I, I agree. I don't think we're in conflict. I think we're just emphasizing different parts of the a very complicated puzzle. Um, I think the question is a really interesting one, and and I I'm, I'm afraid I'm not going to answer it. <laughs> what I'm going to do is I'm going to point out that technology is uh, in essence neutral. It, it's technology is just technology. When we're asking about how technology can be applied to achieve societal goals that's where the point comes It's what is the application and what does the application what goal is the application oriented towards some technologies are clearly public goods um, they increase you know societal benefits or at least have the potential to do so quite strongly um, such as things that reduce water pollution for example other technologies benefit individual they're much more contained they can be deployed much more to benefit individuals or interest groups um and so i i think my fundamental point is whereas scientists researchers experts do we orient our attention in terms of our communication our messages who we are trying to influence um i I'm not aware of a country in the world where strategic water policy is set by the head of state. I may be wrong about that, please tell me, but I'm, I'm not aware of such a country. Um, instead, water policy is generally set by water ministries who are largely um, following <laughs> obligations to deliver water as a resource to other sectors so you know national economic strategy is set we will develop agriculture we will develop cities and so forth then that's defined in terms of the ministry of agriculture and then gradually it filters down into 
you know, targets or expectations that Ministry of Water must obtain. So if we're trying to influence strategic thinking about water policy, um, how do we start influencing the higher levels? Uh, because realistically speaking, focusing all of our attention on changing the policy set by the water ministry is going to have a limited strategic impact and it won't achieve the sort of strategic uh, element for transformation that, we're, that we think is necessary. And also it has to be said that, you know, when we're talking about technology, that the farm level technologies, for example, or some of the digitization technologies that Alexandria was mentioning, um, they cut across sectors anyway. So it has to come up to that higher level. It has to be in a more strategic position. Um, and that's where I think our communication, our focus really needs to shift into the future. We need to articulate societal goals. Then we need to understand what technologies are going to do to disrupt uh, current systems, create new vulnerabilities and create new opportunities. Thank you, Fred. Most welcome. Thank you so much. So I have actually a, a remark from uh, from the audience. Uh, it said that wind fed agriculture is uh, 70 to 80 percent of the potential. Uh, we need to focus again on its productivity in parallel. Irrigation remains uh, a strong tool for resilience to droughts. More and uh, and more, uh, it will it will be competition with the urban water and environment. Treated water has also be uh, has also be to be uh, a hot spot in the in the future more than today. I will ask um, I will ask uh, Mr. Aitl Qadi to comment this uh, this to 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 share with us his feedback on these comments. Uh, well, uh, I would like to say that uh, it's not one or the other, it's both. Uh, in uh, some arid and arid areas, like in my own co country here in Morocco, uh, irrigation is a must. So we have done the uh, calculation and uh, uh, defined our irrigation uh, potential early uh, in the in the 60s and morocco inspired by uh, uh, late his majesty uh, king hassan ii launched a long-term program in mid 60s to put under irrigation 1 million hectares by the year 2000. And uh, we went uh, that way. And I would like to say that in doing so, we, Morocco, did not hesitate to mobilize state of the art technologies for irrigation uh, uh, development uh, and management, along with, uh, of course, capacity uh, uh, development, institutional reforms, and policy uh, reforms. Today, irrigation uh, represents 12% of our uh, agricultural lands but it contributes more than 45% of the agricultural uh, 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 value added. So uh, uh, I think uh, political commitment and uh, uh, a visionary uh, uh, choice uh, on the long term is uh, very, very important. Thank you, Mr. Eidel Qadi, for your, inter your answer. I have another question for Mr. Rabir. Just, uh, said, 
yes, yes. Maybe Fatima, cool. just to, to add, uh, uh, Africa is only uh, is using uh, less than 5% of its uh, water resources. We need to have, I'm uh, talking under the control of Her uh, Excellency, to have the, at least 25% of the area irrigated so that we can can Africa enjoy uh, food, its food uh, security. Uh, so uh, I think what we need more, it's not only technology, I, uh, I agree, and I can say that uh, all the technologies of the industry 4.0 have completely revolutionized the way we understand the hydrological cycle. But what we need now more is to understand the water cycle in societies, the political economics of the sectors, so that we can achieve this integrated water resource management that we are uh, aiming to. Thank you. Okay, thank you for your, your answers. So I have the, the final question uh, for Mr. Rabie. It says that uh, circular water management helps reduce the pressure on fresh water resources and pres preserve high level of water quality for natural ecosystems that uh, we rely on. Uh, wh what are your thoughts about this model? Fatima, uh, did you say circular water management? Uh, yes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, thank you. It's, it's a very important question. And I think uh, I urge all of the, uh, the, the food and agriculture system people, whether they are in the private, whether in the academia, whether they are in the uh, practice, uh, the circularity in the food and agriculture system is extremely important for us moving forward. Uh, I think we have uh, experienced for the last many years, the industrial world have experienced uh, pollution, have experienced abuse in many ways of the, uh, uh, the natural resources for the sake of producing food, for the sake of producing cheap food. And I think it's now about time for us to really look at an inward looking and how can we make a circular food and agriculture system more resilient, more safe, and more affordable. And I think it's a very important element. And I would say that it goes way beyond uh, water management. It goes into uh, reducing our input and, and, and having a circularity in all of our waste management, whether it's in, in, uh, in food waste, whether it's in uh, uh, certainly the context of this discussion is uh, uh, way, uh, treated wastewater. But it also goes way beyond that. And I think this is this is an important aspect that we need to have a self critic critical, uh, deeply critical aspect to uh, to make our food and agriculture system circle and, and make it make it uh, make it more sustainable. Now, in particular, when we look at the wastewater, uh, wastewater reuse for agriculture. Uh, now, if you look at most of the uh, cities that brag themselves for advanced uh, treated wastewater is no longer uh, called as treated wastewater. It's not no longer used as, as a uh, uh, wastewater facility. They're energy recovery facility because all of the energy that is required for treating that water is coming in from the waste, uh, is coming in from the embedded energy in that waste. So, so we need to look at treated wastewater as a source of energy, as a source of uh, water for irrigation, and also as a as a source of water for other uh, other uses. So I think this is an opportunity for the again an opportunity for the food and agriculture system to to embrace this new uh, new trends in terms of technology, in terms of policies, in terms of uh, uh, changing behavior to allow us to take the lead. We have polluted the 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 uh, uh, the our uh, surface water. We have polluted our groundwater. We have uh, had a lot of failures, but it's a, I think it's an opportunity for us to really uh, gain the trust and, and make sure we work towards uh, a sustainable and more resilient food uh, system. So thank you. It's a very important element. Okay, 
Thank you so much, uh, Rabia, for uh, all these uh, brilliant elements. So I know that the subject is very important and one webinar is not sufficient or enough to analyze all the key points of the subject. But and unfortunately, we arrived at the end of the webinar. So I thank you for accepting our invitation and sharing with us all this knowledge. The debate was very rich and we discussed several dimensions, institutional, technological, political, etc. I will be uh, really very happy to discuss with each of you if you have uh, 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 other, other dimension and we, that we can uh, translate into papers or other webinars or discussion. I, the inv uh, I open the, inv inv the invitation for you, for you all. I thank you again for uh, for uh, for responding uh, positively to our invitation, and I I thank also the the audience for uh, for watching the webinar that is organized by the Policy Center for the New Side, and it is entitled uh, "Water Scarcity: Global Challenge and uh, Different Answers." You can watch this webinar uh, 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 and other many content, other content on our uh, YouTube uh, page and uh, on our uh, social networks. So thank you and hope uh, I can meet you uh, again, uh, not virtually this time. Thank you very much, Fatima, and thank you all to all the distinguished panelists. It's been an excellent webinar. Thank you, colleagues. Well done. It was a pleasure seeing you all. Well thank done, you. Fatima. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Right.